analysis of the head. Holy luck. Just overlooking the flat plane of Dallin Longer and across Strathethig. Loch Eck lies in the neck between the hills there. And then to the mouth of Glen Lean. And then behind the trees immediately in front of me is Balak Isle. Those are the hereditary homelands of the MacIver Campbells who are buried on this hill. Uh, Tom does have an amazing view over the landscape round about it. As you can see as it pan around. See all the flat land hereabouts and down Holy Lock on the other side. As we approach it, climb up the side of it. It's now covered in really, really mature, towering beech trees. This been planted a good couple of centuries ago. And climbing up the flank of the hill. Difficult to see if it's been moulded or artificially shaped over the years. So the roots of the beech trees are so massive. As you climb the hill very quickly, you see by how steep the flanks of it are. You get quite a view over the field just in front. which possibly serves a more ancient purpose than being the mausoleum for the MacIver Campbells. As you come over the crest of the hill, you can see the mausoleum enclosure. And it's also interesting how flat top of this hill is conveniently flat and over the years this could have contained any number of structures Campbell built this in 1763 but who's to say such a perfectly flat hilltop like this such a useful location. It wasn't used for something else before, even long before. The mausoleum itself used to have finials at each corner, gone now, and a triple step finial above the doorway. It used to be enclosed as well properly. Lintel above the doorway. If you make it the carved initials A C seventeen sixty-three. Alexander Campbell of Balakile built this mausoleum in 1763 for his daughter Susan. Now Alexander is an interesting figure. He was born in 1711. His eldest child, Susan, was born in 1736. She married a Cuthbert Kelburn of Rothsey, who was a shipmaster in Grunick. Now He had a share in the Grunick distillery and was involved in the sugar trade out to the slave colonies. Unfortunately, Susan obviously died young at 27. And this is the grave her daddy made for her in 1763. The table grave is worn and eroded now. I think it says, Herein lies the corpse of Susan Campbell, daughter of Alexander Campbell, Laird of Balakhile, and wife to Cuthbert. Miss Cuthbert, 
and that will say Kilburn. It's Greenock. So we know that Cuthbert was a shipmaster and a merchant of Greenock. Now as a dowry present to Cuthbert and Susan when they're married, Alexander seems to have bought them, or perhaps Cuthbert's parents bought them, uh, Langhouse, overlooking Inverkip, just still there. Susan had a daughter, which they named Christian, who was one and a half when Susan sadly died. And it gives you her death date here, 26th of October, 1763. Age 27 years. Yeah, 27 years. But Susan is not the only one in here. This became a family mausoleum. This plaque is sacred to the memory of Alexander Campbell of Balakhile, the late Lieutenant Colonel of the Argyll Militia who died at Dunloskin House on the 24th of December. 1819. Now, much later, descendant from the family line. Now, Susan was Alexander's eldest daughter. There was another one listed as Grizzled Campbell, which came from Griselda, which apparently would have been shortened down to either Zelda or sometimes Grace as a nickname. She had children, as did Susan's brother, also Alexander, who this Alexander stems from. And there's also Mary Campbell. Mary was the mother of the Alexander Campbell who built this mausoleum. She was married to Charles Campbell, Alexander's dad. She was his second wife, considerably younger than him as well. She was originally Mary Clark before she married into the Campbell family. From Susan Campbell's monument to Alexander Campbell's monument to Mary Campbell to this one, the most recent plaque. We're in the MacIver clan crest. I am the resurrection and the life. Alexander Campbell of Balakhile, Ensign, in His Majesty's 55th foot, born at Kilmun House, the 30th of July 1812, died at Bellary, Madras, on the 18th of February, or the 8th of February perhaps, 1833. And also to William Rose Campbell of Balakhile, his younger brother, a Deputy Lieutenant for Argyle and Justice of the Peace, Lieutenant Colonel in His Majesty's Madras Staff Corps. Born at Dunloskin on the 7th of September 1818 and died in 51 Lauriston Place, Edinburgh. It must have been a nice place here, they mentioned it, on the 22nd of March 1872. Sons of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Campbell of Balakhile of the Clan Ever. Alistair Morrison, infant son of William Rose Campbell of Balakhile, and his wife Jean Morrison Buchanan, Hetland, Dumfrieshire. Born at Madras the 16th of September and died the 21st September 1863. It's a shame. And also to MacIver Forbes Morrison, MacIver Campbell of Ballachyle and Hetland, captain in the Canadian forces during the Great War. Born at Outcamond, Madras, Presidency on the 17th of June 1867 and died at Victoria in British Columbia the 22nd September 1932. And the most recent one, Alistair Morrison MacIver Campbell, born 11th December 1910, died the 22nd of March 1978. It's quite an impressive plaque. It's a strange place, this mausoleum. It's very quiet. It feels almost a bit eerie being here by yourself. It's also very real, having researched these people's stories and found out a bit about their lives, when they were born, where they lived, some of what they did, their loves and their marriages. And they're here. Or at least the spirit and the remembrance of them is here. 
quiet place to spend eternity. Tom and Rai might not always have been a mausoleum. It might not always have been the purpose of this place. And around the north side of it now, to give you an idea of how it may have worked. Now, on the Northern Survey map now, it's called Tonan Ra. In 1819, one of the survey plans of the area also called Ton An Ra. The Gallic names shift, they move over time. When the English and Anglicised cartographers come in and try to write down, to put into words, the Gallic names that they heard. What it could be is Ton An Ri. And that in Gallic means the Hill of the King. Now, why? Is there a hill of a king in the Holy Loch? Let's think about the purposes of that hill and what it could have served. Now, a hill of a king suggests that a king maybe lived on it. But looking at the size of this hill, I don't know there's enough space for that. It could also be a place where the king did business. And that is potentially where we can find some meaning in that name. Now if I walk around the side of this hill, this will probably give you an idea of what I'm talking about. I'm on the northwestern side of the hill. Now if you can imagine a king in medieval, early medieval times, addressing his people, it's not just a contractual meeting where one person stands up and says their piece. A king addressing his people is about prestige, it's about the ceremony of the occasion. And a hill like this lends itself very well to that ceremony. Very well to the, the idea of a man building his prestige. This is the path of a king using this hill when they came to the people of Dallin Longer and the Holy Log. Think of the theatre of him addressing these people. He approaches from the north of the hill, out of sight, onto the top of the mound. No mausoleum back then. And he sees the land open up like a carpet in front of him. He's above those below. The settlement. A string of houses. Through the trees. Over there. About out of sight now at the moment. Kaman Parish Church. There's a religious centre nearby. Those fields behind the modern houses. Dallin Longer. The high place where the ships are pulled up. Perhaps he arrived there by those ships, fleets pulled up in the distance. And the people, the people of Dallin Longer, his retainers, his army, have gathered to hear him speak. And they've gathered in the field below. So the king arrives, possibly some noble retainers nearby. He can look military and impressive. And he takes his place. He approaches the edge of the hillside, towering above those below. I wonder, is it evening time? The fires, torches guttering behind him, silhouetting him against the ridge behind. And then he calls down to his people below and addresses them. His words carry out across the field down below. Hundreds can hear his words looking up at their king. And his prestige is reinforced. As is the prestige of this place. This becomes the hill of the king. A special place. A place used when the leader comes to this part of the world. This part of the kingdom. Hail to the king! So if this is the hill of the king, which kings are we talking about that could have used this? In the medieval period, we know for one king who definitely came to visit this place. That's King Alexander II. Now he... Whoa, he ruled in the first half of the 13th century in Scotland. And by that time, Scotland was growing in strength. It was stronger. It was by no means what we know of as modern Scotland or would identify as one Scotland on a map yet. Instead, um, the Western Isles, the Northern Isles, Galloway, Argyll are all owned by other powers. Either the Norse Vikings or the Lords of the Isles. 
even the Island Man has its own little chunk of Scotland or its influence over Scotland. Alexander II decided that he was going to add the sub kingdom of Argyll into the kingdom of Scotland by removing its lord Ruri of Ragnall. Now, Ruri had recently become a threat to the kingdom of Scots. He had either sided with the McWilliams, who were a disinherited branch of the Scottish royal family, who perennially sat around as a kind of rebellious threat towards Alexander II's rule. There's potentially one reason why uh, Ruri had to go. The other reason is that this time it seems to be that Isle of Man, the Kingdom of Argyll, or the sub-Kingdom of Argyll as it was, along with the Lords of the Isles, and perhaps Galloway too, were coming together in an alliance. Now that is a power block Alexander could not tolerate, so he had to act. And his action in 1221 and 1222 was to remove Ruri. Now he did that by gathering a fleet at Renfrew on the Clyde, sailing down river to attack Argyle. Now Argyle at that time is by no means the size of modern Argyle as we recognise it now. Uh, what we're talking about here is Cowl, Mid Argyle, which would be the Camarton Glen, and Napdale. Kintyre was still part of the Lords of the Isles domain, so if you had a, a map of Argyle now and had a big marker pen and you just drew it across uh, the middle of the map in the middle of Argyle, that would be the Argyle they can kind of understood as being Argyle. So, not an enormous campaign. But a potentially tricky one. So Alexander brought his men down river, but apparently in 1221 the campaign had to be abandoned due to the bad weather. Still had ferry issues back then it seems. Um, in 1222 the weather was better and the campaign was a resounding success. Not only was Alexander able to add the sub-kingdom of Argyll to the wider kingdom of Scotland, he was also able to expel Ruri from Kintyre and add that to his kingdom. Now we know Alexander II himself campaigned in Cowl and that Ivor Crom, who was the eponymous founder of the MacIver clan, campaigned with him. Now he hailed from Glen Lyon in Persia uh, and he as a reward for his service, story goes, was awarded lands and possessions here in Cowl. And if I turn around that wooded hill behind me is Balakhail, and that's what his family were given. So there's still a farm there, there's still a fairly fancy house nearby. And Ivor Crom's clan or family became the MacIvers over time and have stayed in some way on that site really until modern times. It had a little bit of uh, an issue footing about with uh, their feudal overlords, the Campbells, um, and had to cut a deal with them at the end of the 16th century. And from that point, the McKeevers adopted the Campbell name onto theirs and they became the McKeever Campbells. And then over time, by the time we get to Susan Campbell and our dad Alexander, Alexander Campbell with our mausoleum, they've become full Campbells. But that's why there's the McKeever crest inside the mausoleum. Now going back to Alexander II's story, and what he was doing there, um, he seems to have conquered Cowl, this place here, and it makes sense. Now, once again, I'm going to go back over to the lip of the, the hill. If he brought a fleet and he wanted to land and take Cowl, certainly this part of Cowl anyway, southeast, then it either makes sense to land his ships here at Dallin Longer, at the head of the loch, the high place where you pull up your ships on that flat plain down below me, um, or else to do it a wee bit further around to the west, maybe in Kilbride Bay. There wasn't as much population around that way. Um, so landing here, if his army are down in that field below me, over there, wait, and his ships are over there, is this his hill? Is this where he addressed his men in victory after his campaign? Is this where he awarded Ivor Crom? His land's just over there on the other side of the valley. Is the Re, or the king that this hill's named after, Alexander II? 
who stood possibly here in this spot in 1222. Now we know after Alexander's successful campaign he wanted to make sure that the lands of Argyll stayed his. So he granted rights for the Salons of Dundonald who would become the Stuarts to build a castle in Dunoon. And that's when Dunoon Castle we know was built but probably really rebuilt over the site of something much more ancient. Also know at that time as a result of the campaign um, Tarbert was made a royal castle and one was erected there as well. And from that point on Argyll was part of the Kingdom of Scotland proper but it is interesting that it was adapted so or adopted into the Kingdom so late on. In the meantime islands of the Clyde and the Western Isles remained under the control of ostensibly the Kings of Norway but realistically under the Lords of the Isles uh, the dynasty of Summerled at that time. Potentially, Tom Nan Rai could also be involved in a far more ancient set of kings. Before Alexander II, Argyll was not a kingdom by itself. It was a sub kingdom. It was owned by the Lords of the Isles intermittently, um, often for a long time held by a group of people called the Gaul Gael, a combination of the, the Norse settlers who came here and the Gaels who lived here before. And the Lords of the Isles intermittently called themselves kings or just lords. And they ruled the roost around here from around about 870 through to Alexander II's arrival in 1221 and 22. So whether or not it's them, it's difficult to say. I can see a kind of maritime power where the Lord would sail around his domain and reinforce his control and his authority. I can see that they would pull their ships up at Dallin Longer, up at the head of the loch over there, and it is a short walk at best to come to this hill to hold court over your, your people and your followers, do your business, also enjoy the prestige, once again like possibly Alexander, of being above the people and talking down to them, holding the position of power. But, were they kings? Did they regard themselves as kings? It seems to be that the Gaels were a kind of sub subclass of people uh, and their language was regarded as being inferior to the, the Norse language during the time of the Lord of the Isles. So for the idea of the hill to be called Tom Nan Rai, the hill of the king, and to, to follow through from that seems maybe not so convincing. Possibly going even further back um, to the early medieval period, from other videos you'll see that I have made the argument that um, there was a frontier called the Drum Alban, the spine of Britain that ran down through the middle of Cow. And uh, where we are just now, Tom Nan Rai, at the head of the Holy Loch, we would be on the eastern side of that frontier. We would be on the land or the territory of Outclute or the Kingdom of the, the Britons. West of here would have been the edge of the Dalriadans and the Gaels where they spoke Gaelic. But back in the, up until 870 when the Vikings came and sacked Outclute and destroyed their kingdom, then this would have been a Britonic or Old Welsh speaking area ruled by a king who would have been peripatetic. Now the kings in the early medieval kingdoms tended not to just camp in one capital city and just stay there. To enforce their um, power across the domain, they needed to be visible, they needed to be seen. And to do that, they would go on a royal progress. They would work their way around from different palaces and halls around their domain. Sometimes it'd been staying in their own official designated royal palaces and stay there for a few weeks or a few months and then move on to the next place. Sometimes they'd be staying in the manners or halls of prominent lords or individuals around their domain who would give them hospitality, give them service. The idea is that the king and his court would suck up a lot of resources so you couldn't have them staying in the one place for too long. They would need to move on so they didn't fatally drain the resources of an area and leave it hard up for the winter. So this perambulation around the kingdom is a way of them being visible, being seen by their people. It's a way of them patrolling the kingdom, making sure it's safe and secure because the king would always go around with an elite and professional war band of soldiers. It's a way of the king to go around and gather taxes, to renew bonds of loyalty with his people and to give out favours um, for deeds done and services, possibly also to recruit um, and gather soldiers if there's going to be a hosting or a raid or an attack or a war uh, about to take place. So when a king is going to work his way around his domain, He's going to need lots of places where he can visit and be seen by his people. 
potentially this hill, Tornan Rai, offers one of those places. Perhaps we have the the kings of Alcolute Britain between as far back even as the, the 6th century with Ridder Hale um, and as late as Artgal uh, in 870 making their way around the Kingdom of Alcolute, coming to this valley, gathering their taxes, convening with their people and it's that echo of the importance of this place that uh, was taken on by the, the subsequent people um, the subsequent rulers who would have come in and taken over the, the names for places would still have existed um, and been recognised. So potentially it's a very distant echo of a very ancient process and an ancient tie between kings and their people. Thanks for coming to visit Tom Nan Rai with me today. If you like this video, please click like. If you enjoy what you see, please subscribe below. Thanks for watching. That's fun today. Nice trip. Let's get out of here before the farmer shoots at me. What a cool place. Really enjoy visiting that one. That place has a feel about it. Definitely feels unusual, especially up in the mausoleum. Mm. What an amazing place we live in.